this is my walk to work. This is where I cross the road and try to avoid all the bicycles, which I tell you isn't easy. That's the florist. That's the 18th century undertakers, where I think they took Nelson when he died. Uh, that's the cafe where I get my coffee every morning. I get a flat white. I don't really know why. I don't even know what it is. I just sort of like the sound of it. And we're just coming up to my bookshop where I sell books. Now I just have to find my enormous set of keys. Ready for my very loud bell. So, this is a show about books. Those books that you read and you love and you lend to your friends and you can't stop talking about and you bring to book club and the only way you can explain how you feel about them is that you want to clutch them to your heart all the time. This morning we've got the poet Lem Sisse coming in. Uh, Beth Orton is going to pop by for 11 this, so I'm excited about that. And then my friend Elizabeth often walks this way on her way home, so um, she might also come take me for a drink at the end of the day. The ones I nearly bought. I know they're the best boots in the whole world. Are they really comfy? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> For dancing. I'm um, coming. I was just about to put the kettle on. Oh, cool. Have a seat. Thanks. Do you want tea? Oh, uh, yes, please. Okay. I'll put that on. Right. That's your meat. Thank you. Cheers. That follows what happens. Cheers. Aww. Cheers. Um, what are you reading? Lincoln in the Bardo. How far through are you? Not so far. I'm halfway through. Halfway through. Yeah. What did you think when you first started? At first I was just like, I always go into books thinking they're going to be like, like meeting someone much more clever than me. And I'm like, oh, go on then, I probably won't understand, but try me. And then, but once you get over that, yeah. you just read it as a story, it's fine, yeah, it's brilliant. So a bardo is like a, the Tibetan in word, between, the in between. Yeah, so in between you... states of what, so you're between death and life and... That kind of that kind of place where you're neither here nor there, you're neither you know yeah, not entered or left. Which is why when you start reading it, you think it's going to be such a weird book. You see, I literally picked it up off the table. Yeah. Because my brainy husband gets books, and I, I was like, <laughs> oh, fuck, what's this shit? Yeah. So I picked it up. So I had no idea what I was reading. Right. So I just thought I was reading a story about a nice man who wasn't. <laughs> forcing his wife into having sex with him when she clearly didn't fancy him as far too young for him. Right. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> and then suddenly I just went completely like, what the fuck? He's, he's yeah. dead? Yeah. He's dead with an erection? Yeah. He still goes hard on and yeah. it's like, that's it for the rest of his life. <laughs> like, you know, his dead life. Well, um, that's where he makes the bardo seem strangely um, believable. That yeah. by the time you're about a quarter of the way book, you're like, well, of course there is a bardo where people Absolutely. go after being dead, but before. And also just like now, I'm like, well, maybe we're yeah. in bardo. This is our bardo. Yes, we're here. Maybe we are. We are, because the thing is, I think about it, it's just like, yes, everyone's distorted thinking becomes like, in the, once they're in the bardo, it becomes the bardo. <laughs> the bardo. <laughs> I've got a new way of saying it. And it makes it sound really yeah. glamorous Go rather, than a, rather than a miserable yeah. place where everyone's like <laughs> screaming and tearing like at their life. hair. Yeah. yeah, and then ways of being stuck. Yeah, well, that was the interesting thing, the idea of being stuck in your old life. Yes. And what's the new life? And you don't actually have to be dead to have that feeling. No, it's like you do being not. unwilling to go from your old self to your new self. Exactly. Which I feel quite a lot of the time. Me too. Like coming to terms with that you're not that person anymore, yes. you're a new person. The, the description in two pages of this love that grew between them. And now he just has to walk for the rest of his life. I can't dead remember life. which bit that is. I want well, to read it again. Exactly. I'm clearly yeah. obsessed with it. I can't stop thinking about his huge erection. But yeah, <laughs> so so just like, yeah, there's the other woman who has like the three daughters who are just the orbs. Yeah. They just float around her, hating her. I think yeah. That, yeah. But the, when you describe like that, it does seem like maybe that we are all in the bar, don't I think so. Yeah, and it's That's just an I'm, extreme example. Yeah. Oh, God. Or is it? Or is this the extreme I example? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's very unpretentious. It's true, yeah. Yeah, yeah it really is. Yeah. And, 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 and it has, but it has so much going on. 
you know, probably would want to read it a few times yeah. to really understand. Yeah. I was reading Sadie Smith talking about the book right. and saying that you're the person that you were before you read the book and then after you read the book. And that's a, that's a different person because you suddenly oh. have this whole idea of, yes, like you say, the bardo. Maybe we're all in the bardo. Yeah, he's changed us. I didn't know anything about George Saunders. I think he's yeah. one of those weird, he's really famous in America, but a lot less famous in Britain, right. I think. Yeah. Apparently this is his first novel, right? Everything else is short <laughs> yeah. stories. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's pretty wild. It's pretty wild read. Do you find you're reading a lot at the moment or not really? Or Well, I'll just say this. I'm just going to come out with it. I'm just thinking about me and my reading. It's been a bit problematic right. since having kids. Now, I've right. started so certain Let's things. do some bibliotherapy. Yes, yeah, tell me that. Stuff. What's the problem? Yeah. Well, once you have kids, yeah. everything's you guilty. You can't keep a thought in your head. <laughs> and and yeah. they're completely like, it all just pours out one end. It goes in one end and just dribbles out the other. Yeah. So I've been doing Proust on Audible. Because I'm like, hits. oh, but it's genius. It's amazing. Because <laughs> his voice is like this. Except for when he does ladies' voices, which gets a little bit tricky. Because he does them like this. He does do a lady's voice <laughs> like that. And you're like, oh, stop. Jesus. <laughs> no, it's just very jarring because oh, you're brilliant. trying to get to sleep. It's yeah. also just like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to... I'm trying to get to sleep, Proust. Come yeah, on. Have Be a word. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the other thing is I found out, actually, this is ridiculous. I needed glasses. Right. Because I just couldn't accept that. I was like, I don't need glasses. I'm not old. You see, I'm, it's the, yes, pos the person you were before and exactly. after. You've got to accept. I can't accept it. Yeah. So suddenly I put glasses on and I'm now like, oh, I can oh, read. Right. It wasn't just I'd lost my mind. I, it's just I couldn't see. Right. Do you remember I, like learning to read or who taught you to read or any of that? I remember having to sit, I remember having learning to write. I remember being put next to a boy who had nice handwriting <sighs> and being Andrew Powers. Yeah. And I had to like <laughs> copy his writing because I was so shit at writing. My handwriting, uh, obviously. Obviously. Obviously my writing was <laughs> amazing. Yeah. yeah. Did you always write, apart from the terrible handwriting? Yeah. Did you always write? Yeah, I did. No, I, always, I did. Always, I always, I was always like journal, like like noting things, make notes, make notes of everything. Everything must be noted. Do you still so, have them? I did keep little journals and I did have pa like pages of things that I'd write and notice and things, but I don't know where they are. Mm. I, I might have them. I've got boxes of stuff to go through. And do you think your writing has changed? since having kids well I think so I I hope so I mean I don't know I'm doing right now so f with my last record which came out um, a couple of years ago kids sticks I wrote through the medium of sound so sound came first right. and then and these sort of these loops and I wrote to that and that really instructed everything so it instructed my lyrics as well right because it was all about rhythm it was all about keeping to this kind of or this this I don't know it, it was different so this time I'm going much more through the words because you write a new album now yeah. Well, I'm writing. I never. I'm writing. Like, I mean, like, no, writing. God knows what genius. <laughs> knows what genius it will be. Yeah. Writing something. Yeah, yeah. It, I don't, I don't, I hope, you know, maybe. Yeah. yeah. I, think it, I hope. You know. Mm. Anyway, so I'm writing it, and I, I'm going through the words this time. So I'm like, I just don't. I don't quite know. But I'm going. Okay, I've done. It's my brain has its own, or whatever part of me it is that writes has its own logic. So I'm like, all right, dude. Just do your thing. Tell me what the trashiest book you, you've you ever read that you love is. Gosh, I mean, I always get a bit embarrassed, but I love Anne Tyler. <laughs> I love Anne That's Tyler. That's not embarrassing. That's She's brilliant. She's amazing. amazing. Like the way she does that thing where she yeah. flips characters around. Like so you're like, okay, that's the mum. And then suddenly you're like, no, yeah. that's the mum. That's like, not oh. embarrassing at all. Okay. That, trashy is like... Jilly Cooper, yeah, who, well, by the way, is brilliant. Yeah, there's probably a bit of that, because yeah. my mum had a couple of Jilly. Is there one with, like, a on it? Yeah. Riders. <laughs> yeah, yeah, obviously, yeah. it's one of the greatest books ever written. Right, Have one. you not read it? I think I've read that I one, mean... yeah. I probably was, like, reading was that one. Of course, you <laughs> yeah. sneak it for the second. Yeah, scene. exactly. Yeah. Like, with, yeah. What about a book that you feel like you're supposed to like, but actually you think is rubbish? Most of them. I mean, <laughs> you know, just, like, in general, I'm like, oh, God, here we go. Yeah, that's boring. Yeah. yeah. So, um... Okay, look, if it was up to me, I'd just sit and drink tea with you all day, but I, I should go... Okay, okay, um, go on, get on. I should on. go sell some books. Excuse me, can I just ask you about the last book that you read? Oh, it was The Secret by Rhonda Barry. Oh, The Secret, the Secret by Rhonda... And did you enjoy it? Yes, definitely. 
tell me what you loved about it. When it gave me uh, too much motivation about life. Yeah. If you think about something, the whole journey was, you know, conspires to make you achieve that. Yeah. And I love that. Do you feel like it's working for you yet? Of course. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Love it. Tell me what you're reading. I'm reading Mrs. Dalloway by the wonderful Virginia Woolf. How is it? Um, I'm only on page uh, 26, and I am. It's pretty confusing. <laughs> Can I just ask you, what's the last book you read? All right, yeah, it's um, Jensen Buttons, autobiography. And how was it? It was good. The first few pages, pretty boring. <laughs> but once you get into it, it's a really good read. Yeah, not too bad. I read The Fingersmith by um, Sarah Waters. Yeah, that was good. That was really engaging. I love that book. Yeah. What was the last book that you read? It was uh, Sheryl Sandberg, Lean In. How was it? It was amazing, yeah. Do you it feel was, like uh, you're doing a lot of leaning in? Uh, well, it's mostly about empowering women, so right. I'm uh, looking at it from the um, Jesuit's perspective. But yeah. So, what was your main takeaway from the book? Um, it's uh, I'm actually on the phone at the moment, but um, great. Tell him as well. Uh, <laughs> Tell a friend. Uh, so, it was uh, the main takeaway was uh, that women should uh, not have not feel like an imposter when they're in a situation with men and not feel inferior. But then, like men have to obviously take that into account as well from that side of things. Love that so you read it. Was it was great. It was Brilliant. really good. good. I recommend it. What was the last book that you read? The uh, yeah. Suspicions of Mr. Witcher. <gasps> and did you enjoy it? Yeah, it's a good book. What did you love about it? It was a murder mystery, but true to true to life. Yeah, so it was you good. Like and it was uh, it was the history of the map, blah blah blah. Um, what made you read it? Did someone tell you? About uh, my it? other half had it. Ah. I just picked it up because I was bored. Um, Noam Chomsky's. Oh. What's the title of it though? The... Chomsky. What's which one? What's it about? The world, the state of the world. He's a he's a MIT professor. Uh, how, how was it? Do you enjoy it? Yeah. Yeah, what do you need to know? Is that it? That's it. Just okay. if you enjoyed it or if it was boring. Oh, no, 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 no. It's great. I think the world's changing. Yeah. We're in for a civilization collapse, so we all need to wake up. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. Cheers. I have been so loving this, which I know you're going to say, oh, it came out a while ago and I'm writing lots of new stuff. Yeah, well, it's a collection of my work since I was, I, 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 since I was sort of 17 to now, so. So with the very first poem in it. I probably wrote that when I was. Did you? 16, Hang yeah. On. This one. Oh, that one. Will no, you just that, read that oh, for no. me? Oh, no. Oh, that one. Yeah, no, no. Yes, I did write that at 16. Oh, hang on, the postman. I love. Hang on, excuse me just okay. a sec. Come in, come in. Oh, no, no, that's fine. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Sorry. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, I did. I wrote this when I was uh, 16, 17. Will you read it to me? Well, I. Well, I am a poet and it is my life. I would slit my wrist with a pen, not a knife. Well, I am a poet from now until then. My life is my paper, my knife, my pen. I am crazy about that poem. So I'm you, so happy so that you, you said so that. So you, you, do you think you were 16 when you read, when you 16, wrote that? 16, 17, See, yeah. See, amazing. Yeah. I, yeah. That is just, I'm so pleased because um, it's true. It's true. And my poems were like um, flags in the mountainside of my journey. I uh, love how early you were a poet. Yeah, it's I knew extraordinary. early. extraordinary. Yeah. It's a good time to write poetry when you're that age because you think that the world will fall apart unless you say what you've got to say. Right. And there's only two times that that happens. One is in your teenage years that you have a compulsion. You have to say what you've got to say, otherwise you'll, you will fall into a million pieces. Uh, as if the world would end tomorrow. And then towards later in life, then when you know that you're going to pass away. Oh. Well, I know, I know. But it's at those two points, it doesn't matter whether you're 20 or yep, 75, right. yep. when you know it's going to end, you have an urge to write down your thoughts, mm -hmm. to be recorded. Do you remember the first poem that you were aware of or read or what got you interested in poetry as opposed to any other form? The first poem that I do remember is uh, about a, a cat called McCavity. <gasps> McCavity's a mystery cat. He's That's... called the Hidden Paw. That's like the best poem ever. What <laughs> age do you think you were when you when you first read that? Uh, I must have been uh, eight or nine. I mean, underneath that is a book that's done really well, which I'm not into at the moment in my life, but it has done really well, and it's called The Bible. Oh, <laughs> well, I've heard of yeah. that. Tell me more. But, but, well, it was a, I mean, it was published. It's full of poetry, and it's full of incredible stories. Uh, whether you believe in them or not, and I'm always a little bit 
a little bit nervous of mentioning that book. Right. Because it's like when Da Vinci Code came out. You know, I read Da Vinci Code. I love Da Vinci Code. I'm sorry, but I did. No, don't apologise. No apologising. But I started to learn that yeah. you're not supposed, in certain circles, you're not supposed to like the Da Vinci Code. Well, not you in these circles, but yeah, yeah. But you Da Vinci know, Code is a brilliant book, and you can't put it down for a single second. You read it, and you're like, don't talk to me, don't talk to me until I finish the Da Vinci Code, which is surely the sign of an amazing book. But then you know. I learned, we learned that we're not supposed to, you know, that suddenly there was a sort of snobbery about it. About right. it. And, um, and I think the Bible's probably a bit, bit like that, actually. It's, it's gripped quite a few people. It's got a good publishing <laughs> yeah, deal. It really and it's does. always in print, you yeah, know what I mean? It really does. You know what I mean? Yeah. So then there was The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe and Enid Blyton. Mm -hmm. uh, a book that really stuck in my mind as a... This is all pre-12. Right, gosh. Uh, as I was about 11 was a book called The Cross and the Switchblade. Oh, I don't know that. Tell yeah, me about it's it. About the, it's about the gangs of America okay. and the violence of those gangs and then this this uh, um, preacher uh, Is it a novel? Or... It's a novel. Uh, sorry, right. sorry, it's a yeah, novel. It's, a, it's a novel. Right. And then uh, a preacher goes into the streets of, uh, I think it's L.A. or New York, it's New York, uh, and uh, converts these kind of... Gangsters right. to Christianity. Well, you see what right. the foster parents were getting at. <laughs> right. <laughs> there was a theme. There was a control, actually, right. of, of what books I was supposed to read. Right. Um, but then I wonder what the first book you read was that was outside of that control. What oh, the first kind of, you know, subversive book that you found at school or a friend's house and you were like, oh, there's a whole world out there. That's of, a fantastic question. Of, of other stuff. Um, well, the one that sticks into my in my mind, because then uh, at 12 years of age, I then left those foster parents and I was in all of these strange dystopian uh, institutions. Um, and I, there were no books. Because that's where you were living when you were... That's where I was living. I left, left the foster parents at 12. Right. So my reading just changed massively. Right. And also my memory of what I'd read changed massively. Books are a very good thing for memory yeah. of time and place, where yeah. you were, when you were reading. And um, and there were no books. There were no books in these massive Victorian houses that, that were full of children like me who were parentless. Right. There were no books. Right. Um, Which is, of course, ironic because so many children's books are about parentless children. children. That the child, you know, Absolutely. that you as a child Absolutely. would have felt so connected to and comforted by. Harry Potter, yeah. example number one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wuthering Heights, Heathcliff. Yeah. Uh, even Superman was uh, uh, adopted. Uh, uh, yes. Ol Oliver Twist was uh, um, was also adopted and uh, parentless. And Jane Eyre. Uh, Jane there's Eyre. an adoption in, in Jane Jane Eyre. Parentless yeah. people are right at the heart of uh, literature. Yeah. Um, yeah. But for me, uh, Catch a Fire, the life story of Bob Marley by Timothy White. What was it that you loved about it, do you think? I loved the fact that the experience that this black man had, by the way, he was mixed race. Uh -huh. uh, his father was a white guy called Norville uh, <laughs> uh, and his mother was a black woman uh, called Sedelia. Um, One doesn't meet people called Norville. No, you don't, no, you don't. But, Let's bring it back, <laughs> Norville. But, um, but uh, that he'd had some of the same experiences that I had. Uh -huh. It was quite amazing for me that, that I had a direct line to the experience of Bob Marley through my experience. Yeah. And that was uh, one of uh, alienation, uh, one of the sense of being judged because of your uh, race. Uh, but then you read that and think, oh, I'm not the only I'm one. I'm not the only one, yeah, yeah, yeah. When you come to write a poem, <clears throat> what does that look like for you? How does the poem emerge from you? Or does it vary enormously? Well, um, well, at the moment I'm writing a poem for Canterbury and because uh, I'm the Canterbury Poet Laureate. Uh -huh. uh, I have been for about a year now. Mm -hmm. And it scares the life out of me. So it looks like a blank, blank page, which is the <laughs> most frightening thing to do. And the thing about being a writer is that you've got to, uh, you've got to destroy the blank page, yeah. really. Yeah. And uh, it's a bit aggressive, destroy the blank page, but you but you do because it's very, and um, so for for that poem, for the poem for Canterbury, I'm going to be doing tons and tons of research first uh -huh. and foremost, 
uh, and then write free writing as much as I can mm -hmm. uh, to see if I can find the line that will be the beginning mm -hmm. of whatever it's going to be. Um, because which is... we make stuff from nothing, yeah. okay? There is nothing there, yeah. nothing there. We make stuff from nothing, and as it's being built, you're constantly looking at it thinking, what is it going to be? And you don't know what it's going to be. So you have to have a sort of, you know, you have to have... Grace Nichols, the, the uh, Guyanese poet, um, she said she follows her pen. And to follow your pen, you know, to follow your pen as you're writing, or to follow your, the, 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 the um, letters as you're typing, you have to have a lot of trust. Yeah. You have to throw yourself in there yeah. uh, and free fall into what could be a mess. I know that your biological father was Ethiopian. Yes. He's an Ethiopian airline pilot. That's right. Do you ever speculate on his relationship with books or well, my, with my reading? Dad's. Yeah. I don't think he read much. I've got a feeling that he didn't read much. I mean, he might have done. Um, he might have done. And my mum is also Ethiopian. Uh, uh, she might have read books as well. I, do you know what? I haven't. You because I would have to learn another language. And that language would be Amharic, which is mm -hmm. an old Ethiopian uh, language. And there's just this great thing that's happening around the world at the moment, which is Ethiopians who are between 30 and 40 uh, which means that their parents would have left Ethiopia shortly after the revolution in 72-3-4. Mm -hmm. There are creative Ethiopian uh, children of Ethiopian parents that you can date back to the exodus from Ethiopia in the 70s who are now coming through into the publishing houses. So now the literature is emerging. And... Absolutely. And uh, there's Hannah Poole, she's Eritrean, there's... Mm -hmm. Um, Maaza Mengista in New York, who published the Lion, uh, Beneath the Lion's Gaze. Mm -hmm. There's uh, Dino Mengistu. These are all being published by the big publishing houses, getting reviewed, playing the Hay Festivals, etc., etc. Which is really your favourite, if you were going to recommend one? Uh, Hannah Poole's book, which is incredible, which is called um, My Father's Daughter, is about her own journey in search of her father, who lives in a, a very small, uh, um, on, a, on a farm in, in Eritrea. Mm -hmm. Hannah Poole used to do the Guardian's kind of uh, beauty. Yes. She was the beauty editor for years. Yes. So the idea of this this beauty editor yeah. who always looks stunning yeah. walking through the rural Eritrea, you know, towards finding her, her father is just incredible. Yeah. Um, can I say what's really exciting about going to a bookshop? Of course. It's that, like, you can you can look around a bookshop as a writer. Yes. And you can go, like, you can go, oh, yeah, I met her. I yep. introduced her on stage at the, uh, in Bradford once, yep. or in Leeds, at Leeds Literature Festival. Yep. And it's great when you see writers growing, you know, into these just incredible beings, uh, people that you know yeah. or that, that you've met. You know, when I started writing, she's not around anymore, actually, but Butchie Emichata used to do a lot of readings uh, with the Caribbean writers, actually, in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. I, I came around in the late 1980s. See, so, see, so, and I know her. You know, I know, and, do you know, I've been meaning her. to read this for Right, oh, ages. really? Yeah. Brilliant. I'm going to read Brilliant this tonight stuff. on my way home. Coming into a bookshop, it's like being... It's just quite an incredible thing. I was reading, actually I can bring it out, and it would actually be good to bring it out because it's been so heavy but completely worth it. <laughs> what is it? Like a giant? <laughs> it's, it's a giant tome. It's a giant, <laughs> it's the longest book that's because ever been I refuse, written. I refuse to read on Kindles or anything because oh, I just like the tactile experience of reading an actual book. <laughs> so that's why I've got this slightly unglamorous bag. It's basically a just book, the book bag. <laughs> Here's my giant suitcase <laughs> no. that I keep my book in. Do you have anything else in it? Um, Tell me about it. Okay. All signed first edition. Yes. So this is um, a fallout by Tim Shipman, who's an amazing political journalist. He's the political editor of the Sunday Times. And it's all about the lead up to the shambolic general election of 2017. Isn't it incredibly stressful to read, though? It's 
No, it, because it's so thrilling. I don't know what it is about the way he writes. It's incredibly gripping. He's just got... He's a very good reporter. Right. He's got incredible access. He's interviewed kind of hundreds and hundreds of people. So you really feel like you have a ringside seat to the shambles right. that was Theresa May's election Because it's all like, and then Boris texted so-and-so. Exactly. Right. So did you whiz through it? Well, I'm still, I'm whizzing through it. Yeah. I'm still here, but it is genuinely one of those ones I don't really want to end, <sighs> even though... Even though it's going to end Even badly. Even though it is again going to end badly. <laughs> and it's a tricky also thing to read in the bath because it's quite heavy yes, on one's so wrist. Your, uh, um, I also looked up the, the best-selling books of the week. Yes. Which are um, Fire and Fury, yes. Joe Wicks, the like... Oh, the body coach. The body coach. He talks about broccoli as like miniature trees. Does he? Yeah. As though one's talking to a small child. And then a and then a Lee Child. Have you read any, ever read any Lee never Child? No, nor have I. Child. No. I want to though. I've actually never read John Grisham either. And that's not because I'm being pompous about it. I've just never got around never to got it. Never got around to it. So tell me about when you're starting a new novel, what that looks like for you. Oh my god. It looks like a really <laughs> untidy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> looks like a really untidy and unstable bird's nest <laughs> in the focal point of my brain. Oh, wow. uh, no. So what does it look like? I basically have to allow myself to have an idea mm -hmm. and I found in the past that if I go out in search of that idea it's a bit like sort of hunting for the gruffalo mm. you won't ever find it right. or you'll come up with an idea that you try and persuade yourself to write and it doesn't work organically and generally my ideas come from a mixture of things but in the past they've often been um prompted by something I've read in the newspapers so, right. or something I've done in my job as a journalist so with the party my most recent one I actually started doing that thing of writing the idea that I thought I was meant to have. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which was about um, Northern Ireland in the 1990s, where I grew up. Right. And um, I just got to a point where I felt I was winching every sentence up from a great <laughs> subterranean depth. And just, like, because I was splattering it onto the screen. <laughs> and, um, and I just thought, actually, why am I doing this? Because I'm not enjoying it, and I don't think it's any good. And I'm just going to put it to one side and write about something incredibly glamorous and fun about rich people having a party. Having a party. And that was genuinely the starting point for that. And do you sit at your desk at your computer and tap it tap away? So generally I will do my journalism, I'll get up, get up early and I'll meet that deadline. And then I take my laptop and I go and sit in a cafe because I quite like being around the murmur of other people. And I suppose out in the world. Yes, otherwise I'd never talk to anyone. Uh, otherwise I'd don't. never get any inspiration ever. Yeah. I'd just be on my own in my like, pyjamas. I, I haven't spoken to anyone for days. I have yeah. no idea. Well, how do people talk again? What I've, is dialogue? I've, yeah, I've drunk 85 cups of green tea and I'm feeling really wired. <laughs> um, now can we talk about your date tonight? Oh my God. <laughs> okay, we'll stop filming for this. Um, we'll talk more about books next time. Okay, tell me all. Gives a fuck about an actual climber. I climbed the dark shallow too. I did. I met the high slammer. His accent sounded fine to me. To me. Take your hand up. It's no trick. Take the chapstick. Put it on your lips. Crack a smile. Adjust my tie.